I think they pushed farther this way. Good evening, and welcome to the February 11th, 2014 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. If you would all please rise and join me in, a, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pipes are working. Uh, so, item one, are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda from the agenda we're looking at? There's no item five. There's no item five. Thank you. Oh, that's new and different. Any other adjustments? No. Seeing none, on to item two. Um, approval of the school board minutes. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the school board minutes from executive session Tuesday, January 14th, regular business Tuesday, January 14th, and workshop Wednesday, January 22nd, as attached to tonight's agenda and materials. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? All right. Uh, item three, comments tonight from Sierra Bates, our student representative. I will note that Tim is at the District Jazz um, competition this evening, so that's why he's unable to be here. Okay. I got a different excuse. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he said science, but I'm not sure. <laughs> that's right. It's a, okay. He's pretty wild. <laughs> Um, the midterm week went really well. I feel like everybody really studied hard and uh, got the successful grades that they deserved. Um, we are adjusting to the new classes in the new um, semester. Everybody's really excited for break, especially with Winterfest being this week. The school spirit is definitely very high. Um, all, all students are beginning their course selection for next year. And as seniors are wrapping up their college search, the juniors are really starting to pick up with Belinda Snell working very closely with all of us to try to find that best match. And that's about it. Thank you. What are the Spirit Week days this week? Not to put you on the spot, but do you know? Um, Monday was Sweatsuit Day. Today was Hawaiian Day. Tomorrow is, I think, it, College Day, so wear your college sweatshirt. And Thursday is TBT, which is Throwback Thursday. And Friday is the Olympics, so we're, the seniors are going to be the United States, juniors are Jamaica, sophomores, I'm not sure, and freshmen are Ireland. Uh, Ireland? Yeah, I think they're Ireland. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Could be wrong. Are there any other questions for the student representative? No. All right. Thank you, Sierra. Um, item four, comments from the public on agenda items. I'm not expecting any. Um, so item five, communications. Meredith. Um, so as I said, we have no recognition tonight, but I do have some um, designations to announce. And those are from middle school counselor Gretchen McCloy, high school social studies teacher Gretchen McNulty, High school English teacher Erica Rusley and middle school nurse Jill Andrews. Um, so we want to wish them all well in their future endeavors. That's it for B. I'm curious, and could you pull your mic down a little bit lower or something? Did you say Greg McNulty's not coming back? I did say that, yes. She's been on a leave. She's given us notification that she's not returning. Well, I, I just have to express for the record, I'm extremely disappointed. She's a great teacher, but I'm also extremely disappointed because we gave, that's going to affect my future view on, on um, leaves of absences we give longer than a year. If we gave her two years on assurance that she was going to come back, I mean, we can't make her, slavery's dead, but that's worrisome. Thank you. Um, Item C, 5C. So in your packet should be a proposed budget meeting schedule. Um, we didn't just 
receive, I didn't receive any comments from board members saying that the calendar didn't work, so we will move forward with that calendar. And we are arranging to have the meetings videotaped um, as we've done in the past. So is that schedule also, that would be published online as part of the school board meeting schedule, regular yes, meeting schedule? Yes, it's published online as part of the regular meeting schedule and it will be added to the 2014-2015 budget tab, which is also on the home page. Okay, so if tab people are interested in the scheduled school board budget meetings, they begin February 25th Correct. and the rest of the schedule is on the school board website. Thank you. Item 5D. Strategic plan. So I have two documents. I'm going to send them in both directions. Let's see. Meredith, we're having a hard time hearing you. I, I'm sorry. I'll try to shout over the heat, but I don't want to blow out the eardrums of people trying to watch from home. Well, I think the tables aren't quite as in, so I don't know if I can't hear you because I can't see you well either. So it's. If you need to adjust, then you can slide around. It's cursed. It's either very cold in here and no heat or very loud in here with heat. I'm not quite sure what I prefer. It was very cold at our last meeting, so I'm happy that it's warm. Um, so you have two documents in front of you, and these are, as we understand, both drafts. Um, the first document, which is you hold it this way, um, <laughs> outlines the goals, which go back to the goals and objectives that we adopted back in the fall. And the objectives are underneath those. And you'll see a couple of variations in the objectives as we work through this process. But the first document also lays out measurements for each of the goals. And I'll go through those in a minute. The second document, which parallels the first document, takes each of the initiatives um, and then breaks out work plans for those initiatives, the action steps that go along with the initiatives in the first document. And I've only given you the first two years of the action steps because I wanted you to be able to read them and without getting paper the size of the table, I couldn't really put them um, in a five-year plan to make it readable for tonight. And so, um, again, tonight is really your first introduction to this document, so I want to give you an overview, and I know the board will be spending time reviewing the document at a later date um, to include potentially at the retreat this Friday. So if you start with goal one, goal one was ensuring opportunities for the success of all students by providing a high-quality and comprehensive instructional program. We've listed in there some of the targets. You'll see academic targets. For example, by June 2018, 95% of students will demonstrate a year or more growth in reading, and 90% in math is measured by universal screening da data, NWEA, and smarter balanced assessment in grades three through eight. And you'll note there's a you'll note there's a note there that says that the state assessment system is shifting. Next year will be the first year that we use the smarter balanced assessments. We've been using kneecap assessments, so we've set this target based on a our baseline from our kneecap assessment and we'll be needing to look at that once we receive our first smarter balance data. But again, essentially we feel as a district that 95% of our students should be meeting the proficiency levels um, in reading and mathematics that are established. We see a similar goal for high school students. Um, by June 2018, you see another goal a little further down, number three, 95% of students will graduate from Cape Elizabeth High School with a proficiency-based diploma. Again, one of the things that we set out in our mission and vision was to adopt standards-based reporting. Well, the proficiency-based diploma goes along with that. It happens that the state has also um, adopted that particular expectation. So that's one we'll be spending more time talking with you about as we go forward. Um, another goal for the high school, by June 2018, 65% of the students at Cape Elizabeth High School will graduate with a proficiency-based diploma. Now, I'm sorry, we'll take and pass at least one AP exam. Mixed my lines up there. But right now that's roughly 48%, true for roughly 48% of students. I'm, as we go through, I'm not intending to give you a baseline for everyone. I can, I can share that information with you, but um, to keep this document small, we didn't include that for every, every step. <coughs> so we have other measurable goals related to that around um, increasing scores from PSATs to SATs having students 
the net percentage of students who score at least a 500 on the SAT increase. And then we have some growth for subgroups of students. So a target for our students with disabilities. We want to see their growth targets or their growth um, improve as we move through the next several years. Similarly, for our socioeconomically disadvantaged students, groups of students we've spoken about before whose performance lags behind that of the peers who aren't part of those subgroups. Um, we want to look at an increase in parent responses. And this comes from the survey that we did back in the fall. Uh, we want to increase the percentage of parents who say my child's school does a very good job meeting the needs of all of its students. That's an important metric for us. Um, we want 100% of our teachers to have participated in curriculum alignment in one or more areas. And we want to get a full curriculum review cycle in place in the district. <coughs> and, and we'll take this one and then move, I'll read through the initiatives and then we'll move across to the work plan just so you get a sense of, of how these documents work together. But initiatives for goal one include developing, as I said, a standards-based assessment and reporting system. Um, aligning our RTI student support and intervention team processes and practices K-12. Implementing differentiated instructional practice to meet the diverse learning needs of students and improving access to education to reduce the risk of school failure. And then you see two curriculum related initiatives, aligning existing and developing curricula to the main learning results standards, which right now include common core state standards and next generation science standards, and implementing a curriculum um, review cycle. So now if you take the other document, <coughs> under goal one, initiative one, you'll see that in 2013-14, at the district level, we'll have district and school administrators attending regional and state symposiums and training for evaluating and developing uh, management systems for standards-based grading and reporting. And our Director of Instruction is working with the Maine Department of Education um, to develop an assessment repository for proficiency-based work. At Pond Cove, we're focused on um, implementing rubrics that are aligned to the Common Core State Standards for writing. At the middle school, uh, we're having our middle school teachers work on crosswalking the standards um, to be prepared for the proficiency-based diplomas. At the high school, looks like I start mid-sentence, um, but we'll be working on the proficiency-based diploma system. Teachers will rele receive release time. There'll be work during the summer of 2014 for validation. There's a grading committee that will sit work at the high school to look at grading and reporting options. We'll be beginning, and I'll speak about that later, communication with parents of incoming members of the class of 2018. And the committee will be making recommendations to the faculty regarding standards-based grading um, and reporting separately on behavior components, what we're calling behavior components. But essentially, behavior components are those work habits. Do you turn things in on time? Do you do neat work? Do you communicate your thoughts clearly? Um, so some of those habits. Do you complete your homework? Um, that, aren't, that don't necessarily tell, yes, thank you, Joe, for doing your homework, but they don't necessarily tell whether or not you know the information, they tell whether or not you completed the assignment. Are you guys able to hear? Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. keep up my best teacher voice. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm actually having trouble hearing on this side to see how well that is. Yeah. Seriously. We I'm can, not we can, sure we can. there's much I can do. I don't think you can do anything. <laughs> you can turn your tables no, I, in. I'm also pull up chairs and come up. No, I'm also somewhat concerned for what's getting recorded. He's picking up the microphone, so my guess is he's picking up less of the surrounding noise. I wish we could see him and ask him, but... <laughs> he's giving me the okay. So okay. My vo voice is picking up for the home viewing audience. So it's our problem, but not the problem. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so again, you see a column for 2014 and 15 that shows steps we plan to take next year for that particular initiative. And so... I, I can go through each of these in detail, but I, I'm <laughs> sensitive to time, but just again to look sort of through them. Initiative two is under response to intervention, steps that we're taking um, district-wide and school-wide. For example, at the district level, our K-12 response to intervention teams are participating in district PD seminars on practices and processes. 
We're providing resource materials to the response to intervention teams. We're piloting this year what are called universal screeners. Universal screeners are a quick kind of down and dirty assessment tool that are designed to capture information about student performance so that they're sort of flagging students who are going to require potentially more attention so that you can then do more in-depth screening, more in-depth assessment of those particular students to, to determine what skills you might wish to target and work with them moving forward. Um, so we'll purchase a universal screening tool for next year. That's, you'll see that in the budget documents as we move into budget. And each um, response to intervention team will refine their process of using student data to drive intervention plans. So that's, that's a snapshot of some of that work. Initiative three speaks to the work we're doing around differentiated instructional practice. Again, this year we have 60 educators and administrators um, working with a trainer around the principles of differentiated instruction and how to um, best meet needs of students in their classrooms. And you'll see that that plan continues into 2014-15, where we'll have essentially another third of our teachers have the opportunity to participate in that training. We'll also be looking at during the summer, um, summer of 2014. It is 2014. Summer of 2014, having a group of our um, teachers from across the district will have the opportunity to attend um, the Summer Institute on Academic Diversity at the University of Virginia. The University of Virginia is sort of the birthplace of differentiated instruction. It's where Carol Tomlinson teaches. Carol Tomlinson is the person who pioneered much work around differentiated instruction. And every year they run sort of two weeks worth of um, seminars giving t teachers an opportunity to really practice going in deeper with that work. And then we'll be supporting those teachers during the upcoming school year, the teachers who attend that summer program, to go further with their work and work with another trainer. So building on the work. And again, you see expectations for individual buildings around that work. Improving access to education to reduce the risk of school failure. One of the things we know is that early access is a way to reduce the risk of school failure. Another way that we know we can reduce the risk of school failure is making sure students have proper nutrition and opportunities to um, have a good meal before they start their school day. So under that um, initiative, you'll see things like um, providing a school breakfast program at Pond Cove in the upcoming school year. You'll see full day kindergarten for the upcoming school year. You'll see um, work with local preschools to expose them to the types of things that we're doing in our curriculum so that they feel um, prepared to support students. Under initiative five, Again, we've talked about this a little bit, but this is aligning our curricula with the main learning results standards and the common core state standards. So five and six really work hand in hand. Um, initiative six lays out sort of what the order is of work on curricula in the district. This year, really, the focus is language arts. Next year, the focus will be science. The following year will be mathematics, social studies, um, as we move through. But Initiative 5 speaks specifically to the work going on um, at the district level and in each building around the curricula. <laughs> Waiting for someone to break in with a tambourine. It parallels the, the elementary yeah, school concert for those of you who attended the third and fourth grade concerts. Drumming is alive Excuse and well. Me. <laughs> the elementary school concert was way better. Way well, better. Well, yeah. Way better. It's true. It was. There was a So I'm, I'm flipping back to the other document to highlight um, goal two. Thank you. Don't shoot the and I apologize if you're watching from home and you can't see this document. It's because it would have been very hard to read on the wall behind us. But a PDF copy of this document is posted online with the school board um, meeting information. So people can go on and pull that up. Um, goal two, expand learning opportunities for all students by cultivating an inclusive and supportive district culture. So there really our aims are to support the development of some of those personal traits that we talk about in our mission, vision, and values. Integrity, empathy, responsibility, respect, perseverance, independence, and collaboration. And also to build our students' understanding of global cultures and issues. So measures under that category include having 95% of our students report that bullying is not a problem at their school. 
Um, again, that's survey data that we collected this year. We collect it in two ways, through the main integrated youth health survey that we do um, as a requirement um, for the state that looks primarily at substance abuse and risk factors for substance use, but also through our student survey that we did in grades 5 through 12. We collect that data in a slightly different way at the elementary school. The elementary school is piloting a study, um, piloting a survey this year. So we don't have baseline data yet for Pond Cove, but you'll see that next year they're going to establish the baseline this year so that we can include that information next year. Um, second measure, by June 2018, 95% of secondary students will report that at least one teacher or counselor knows them well, as measured by district survey. Um, right now, that number is at about 76% for our students across grades 5 through 12. We think we can do better. We think it's and we think it's an important way to help students remain engaged in school and we know that um, when students are at risk um, that many at-risk students will report that they don't feel that they have a relationship with an adult in their school system so we think it's one of the best ways we can help our students um, succeed by june 2018 measure three the percentage of parents who report that our schools do an excellent job dealing with bullying will exceed the national average by at least 10 percent again we want, we want the student information, but we also want to hear the parent perspective on this particular initiative. It's not something that schools work on in isolation. It's a community issue. By June 2018... I'm sorry, Meredith. And how would you be collecting the parent data? Same survey that the we gave this year. So this year we did student, staff, and parent surveys. So we would anticipate repeating those surveys on an annual basis. Terrific. Thank you. <laughs> uh, measure four. By June 2018, 85% of parents will report that school prepares their children to be good citizens, as measured by the survey. Measure 5, by June 2018, all students will receive feedback on college career habits and citizenship, as measured by teacher, counselor, and self-assessment. So again, getting back to those character traits, you should be having an opportunity to receive that feedback, not necessarily in the form of the grade that's attached to how well you're performing in the classroom on your academic assignments. And last item there, by June 2018, Cape Elizabeth High School graduate, graduates will demonstrate proficiency in at least one language beyond English. Below that, you see two initiatives. I'm going to have to... My voice isn't made for a <laughs> long time at this. Initiatives expand world language and culture offerings and increase the focus on the social emotional development and well-being of students. So under goal two, you'll see those again spelled out in further detail. For example, under expand world language and culture offerings, you'll see um, this year we expanded world language to our second graders twice a week for 30 minutes in a, what's called a FLESS model. Um, at the middle school, we're offering exploratory Mandarin Chinese at the middle, in an after-school program. We anticipate continuing that program into next year, and next year we anticipate expanding world language and culture offerings to first grade. And you'll see a number of pieces under increase the focus on the social, emotional development and well-being of students at the district level. Part of that support comes in the form of administering that survey on an annual basis and providing the financial support to do that. At Pond Cove, a lot of that work relates to the peaceful Pond Cove work that um, if people at home are, have been following in, in um, school newsletters and information that's come home, is really the work of helping students build um, their social thinking skills, build a behavior response system that builds upon that. There are bi-weekly guidance lessons, there are books available that really speak to some of those pro-social skills we're trying to teach reinforce appropriate behaviors. It's the work that Pond Cove has been doing with Stan Davis, and there have been parent presentations tied to that. Um, there's been a survey, as I mentioned. They're reviewing and analyzing the behavioral data that they collect within the school. They're surveying staff about how's it going, um, and they're analyzing that data. So again, next year they'll establish the baseline for that survey data to build upon as we move forward. At the middle school, a lot of this work revolves around advisory. Um, they'll be working on the master schedule to include advisory on a daily basis. Right now, advisory only meets twice a week, if I'm correct, at uh, the seventh and eighth grade levels. 
It's also about building student voice. So you see they're going to be asking the student council, as they have this year, to lead school-wide events, orientation for new students, the assemblies. They'll be asking the student council members to present at school board meetings. And um, the gentleman who's the current delegate has been unable to make it due to some scheduling conflicts the last couple meetings. But um, that work has, has gone forward. Students are now making the morning announcements at the middle school. They've implemented a peer helpers program. They're working with the high school on a mini model UN program. And you see the building of that work into the next school year. At the high school, that work really revolves around the work. And the middle school has been working with Steve Wessler as well. Um, but the work with Steve Wessler on school climate and doing training um, with students and teachers in the upcoming school year. Back to your first document. <coughs> Goal three, increase student engagement in learning and teacher engagement in instruction. So this is where we talk about providing a variety of options for students to become college and career ready, and a variety of options for teachers to grow professionally that are connected to our individual and district goals. So you see measures in kind of those two categories as you work through this goal. Um, at the secondary level, we want to increase the percentage of students who feel they're provided with useful information about careers, colleges, and other opportunities by 25% over our current performance. And again, we'll be publishing the results of the district survey, so you can look at all these baseline numbers, and I'm happy to provide any of those as well. We also want to increase the percentage of middle and high school students who feel they're required to think about how topics relate to real life situations by 25%. That application, we know, is important for students as they move out into the world. By June 2018, percentage of parents responding positively to the statement, my child's school offers him or her opportunities to explore areas of interest outside the core content areas will increase by 20%. Again, that sense that students should be able to pursue their passions as we identify them in our sort of core, core beliefs. By June 2018, the percentage of parents responding positively to the statement, the school does a great job of challenging my child to his or her fullest potential, will increase by 20%. <coughs> by June 2018, and this relates to technology, eighth grade students will demonstrate proficiency in what are called the ISTE standards, as measured by local assessment. And ISTE standards are national standards that have been sent for basically technology, um, skill use, performance. By June 2018, the percentage of teachers who respond positively to the statement, and this is where we shift into professional development, I'm clear about how my performance will be evaluated, will increase by 25%. By June 2018, 85% of staff will respond that they feel they're encouraged to try new ways of doing things. By June 2018, the percentage of teachers who respond positively to the statement, staff development opportunities at my school and district are very relevant to my work, will increase by 30%. And two other measures, we want to look at the three-year average of high school students completing college within four to five years. We want that to increase 15% over the current three-year average. And there is a sort of national data system, national student data system that tracks that information. It's called College Tracker. And that's information that we can access that covers roughly, I think, 98% of the colleges and universities across the country. And then the last item here, which is really a post-graduation measure, but it involves us getting information from our alumni, but asking, um, asking them if they felt they were well prepared for college in, in particular areas. And we want to increase, we have to establish our baseline, but essentially then we're going to be looking for that to increase by 10% over the remaining period um, of this process. taking a breather, gearing up. Um, initiatives under this particular goal. This is where we speak to, and this, this you saw as a separate, um, a separate objective previously, but we felt that it better fit as an initiative within this, object, within this goal and within these objectives, but increase this district's flexibility to trans transform the educational experience for students by becoming an innovative school district, and we've spoken about that. That's a formal process through which we apply to the state to ask um, for exceptions to some of the state rules in particular areas. 
The second initiative is to strengthen our community connections by developing and sustaining partnerships with individuals, businesses, and organizations to reinforce the learning of 21st century skills in and outside the classroom. Providing staff with relevant and engaging professional development that's aligned with district goals to improve student educational experiences and outcomes. Developing and implementing a new district-wide plan for teacher and administrator evaluation and providing targeted professional development for our special education staff also to improve student educational experiences and outcomes. So as we look at this section of goal three, uh, initiative one really is about submitting a plan and seeing where that takes us as we work with the state through that process. But initiative two speaks to those partnerships, developing and sustaining partnerships. Um, I'll be continuing work with the Chamber of Commerce as a district. We'll continue to work with a number of local groups and organizations, including CEIF, our parent associations, HOPE, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, the Thomas More Memorial Library, those organizations that we partner with regularly to enhance um, the opportunities that we provide to our students. We also see that work going on through our K-12 robotics coordinator, Evan Thayer, and his work with local engineering firms and the work that he's doing um, in classrooms across the district. And then you'll see the specifics, um, again, through the, through the schools. Pond Cove um, has a great partnership with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. They do field trips for first and fourth graders in particular to Robinson Woods, Great Pond, um, and they help sponsor the Chewankee outreach programs that, that teach our students about some of our native species, for an example. Um, middle school has been working closely um, with Cape Elizabeth Land Trust as well to really look at outdoor science education. And at the high school level, they've been working to develop a mission statement. Here is where we put the work that the high school is doing around NEASC, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges accreditation process, because that's an organization that partners with universities and um, colleges to really look at what the expectations are for students beyond high school. <laughs> and you'll see um, under the high school for 2014-2015, exploring job shadowing and internship poss possibilities and plans for a pilot year of, of that work. Mm. Initiative three really speaks to professional development. So it's building upon some of the work that we began um, last spring and into this year with mapping out um, what is it that our teachers would like to see with respect to professional development. How do those connect to our goals and creating, um, with the support of the Director of Instruction, really a comprehensive calendar that lays out what people can look forward to for professional development as we move across the year. And again, that's one, that's one you'll see uh, in, in budget um, as well. Uh, and each school has, has specialized pieces, um, Pond Cove, and, and this is where our collaborative, um, our PLC work, professional learning community work, the collaborative work that we're doing across schools and departments also really fit, fits. Um, and again, you see that laid out in each of the schools detail around that area. <laughs> you also see a focus within that, this particular section on technology professional development. Um, we had some bumps at the beginning of the school year at the middle school with the, with the change from laptops to iPads and we want to make sure we're improving um, the learning experience for our students and the instructional experience for teachers around the use of technology. And as we move into budget, one of the things that we hope to do next year is transfer about 50% of the student iPads at the high school are due really for replacement, but we anticipate moving those iPads down to the lower grades. So by making more devices available to students, we also want to make sure the teachers are ready to use those devices in constructive um, educational ways. Initiative four, develop and implement a new district-wide plan for teacher and administrator evaluation. Again, that's really a district-wide district work. There's a committee that both Elizabeth and Kate are um, involved with the work of, as, as are Kelly and um, Mike Tracy, our middle school principal, Kelly, our elementary school principal, and Troy, our Henninger, our high school assistant principal, um, represent the administrative team. And then there are teachers um, from across the district who are part of that work as well. And Ruth Ellen, our director of instruction. Initiative five is mentioned technology and the ISTE standards. Initiative five really is around the 
technological tools and training for our students to be responsible and productive digital citizens. You've seen some of that work this year in parent presentations, both at Pond Cove recently and at the middle school. Also in our shift to the library um, instructional technology specialist positions and at the middle school next year, the transformation to a true learning commons model um, with support from CEEF for a grant that's going to help really transform that space. <coughs> and again, as we deploy additional iPads across the younger grades, additional instructional tools, we're going to have even greater capacity to really use technology in a more, more dynamic way with students and for student learning. But we want to make sure they're poised to use it in the most constructive ways and that they understand the impact of the choices that they make when they're working in a technology-based environment. So that's it in a nutshell, <laughs> which isn't really a nutshell. There's a lot to read through. Um, and I, I look forward to sort of continuing the conversation um, as we work through this process. I know you aren't able to digest it all tonight, but I'm happy to answer any, any broad questions. Um, I want to thank the administrative team for their hard work on, um, on these pieces as well, because it's, it's the work we do every day, but, but putting it into formats that um, help communicate that work really clearly and effectively to the public is, is another layer. So. And I just um, wanted to add to that, to that thank you to the administrative team, because it may be the work that you do every day, but it's not. But assembling it all and 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 and, and uh, becoming responsive to the to the communities um, and the district's strategic plan in terms of putting these all of these pieces together is a, is an impressive amount of work to do on top of the work that you do every day with students and and, and teachers. So thank you. Um, that yeah, I would said, just like to add to that that. These documents are incredibly powerful tools to make sure that all of the incredible talent that we have within our district is all focused on the same page and everyone's going in the same direction. And the transformation that I cannot wait to see in our district from having that plan in place is just exciting. And so I thank you for your leadership on that, but I truly thank all of those who've put all endless hours of work into putting this together. Other, David? Um, I just wanted, and there's a lot of material here, and there's something in here that I think is important that, quite frankly, I had to search well, a whole time we were talking to find it. Um, the concept of improving our curriculum, the concept of, of, teach, of, of students learning more to compete in the 21st century, there's also another piece, and that is assessing how well they're doing and assessing how well the teachers are teaching. And I, I just think it would be nice to spend a minute telling people the committee we formed, because there is a lot of debate among common, about the Common Core and how you assess for it, um, but we're, we're, it seems to me we're taking an innovative approach by creating a team to come up with assessment tools that are fair, reasonable, and accurate. It's buried in here, I know, but I didn't hear, it might be hot, nice to highlight it for the public. Yeah, I mean, Ruth Ellen could speak to that as well as anyone, but just talking about some of the work that's going on in curriculum development and alignment and how that's taking shape at the high school in particular. You have to come up. You're punting already? I'm giving them an opportunity. <laughs> Hello. Um, we've got a number of things going on semi-simultaneously, but as we are moving toward proficiency-based diplomas and doing that alignment, we're also looking at our assessments that we're currently using, the assessments that we will be using to allow students to demonstrate in multiple ways how they've met those standards moving toward that diploma in 2018. Um, but we're not looking at just the incoming freshman class. We're looking at those assessments across the board for all students so that we can begin that process of how do we know what kids know, when they know it, and what are we doing to give them multiple opportunities to demonstrate that knowledge in different ways. And again, if they need to do it multiple times to get there because it shouldn't be a matter of just one time, that's it. It's okay, some need more time, 
some can do it more quickly, and making pathways for those opportunities to be available. I, I think another piece of your question, David, was around how, how do we look at curriculum as a district? Do we just say, oh, thank you, here are the Common Core standards, that's what we're going to do, and we're all done? And that's really, really not, not how the no, curriculum no. process works, so maybe you can just... Okay. Um, for instance, with the Common Core, we are granted a lovely, very large document, but that's not the curriculum. That's a group of standards that we then need to turn into curriculum. We take those standards, unpack them, look to see what is being recommended and what will be tested at each grade level, looking at what we currently teach. Does that align? Do we want to move where this is taught? Do we need to change the way that it's taught, the depth to which it is taught? Do we need to make some local decisions and say, okay, that's being assessed here, but we're teaching it here and we feel that's a better choice for our kids and we have that latitude. And so we're in the process of looking at those documents and unpacking them along with the work that's been done in the years past because there's no reason to throw out what's working. We want to beef up what we have to truly present the best opportunities for our kids that we can. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important piece that, you know, anytime you're given a set of standards, that's it's a useful tool, but that's really the starting point to conversations. And the work really comes with our teachers and who know our students having conversations and dialogue and making local decisions about what's best for our our students moving forward in the context of knowing what's going on at a national and even global level. Well, my understanding was, and I can't remember what it's called, innovative schools or something like that. We're contemplating going beyond or in addition to or higher than the Common Core. Is that? I mean, I, I think in a, a number of areas, and I'm not going to ask you to pull out specifics, but there are a number of places where that's already true. The Common Core might have an expectation for a particular skill to be taught by the end of the fourth grade, but it may be something that we're teaching in third grade. Um, which means then that we're building upon skills as we move further forward. And again, those are really local decisions based on what we know about our students and, and their performance. And the third part was the other end, which is, for, just to use the politically sensitive phrase, teacher assessments. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it would be helpful to talk about what we're doing in that regard, because that's perhaps somewhat of a controversial issue nationally, whether it should or should not be. It's a different question, but I, I think we formed a committee and we have... We have a teacher and administrator evaluation committee. There's a law in Maine that requires that every school develop a plan consistent with some rules that have not yet been written. Well, they've been Thank written, you. but they haven't been um, adopted yet at the state level. So we're working with some parameters, but not 100% clear parameters at this point. Um, but our goal is to design a system, again, that works well here in Cape Elizabeth to help inform um, the work that our teachers do every day with students in our classrooms and the work that administrators do every day with teachers and staff in our schools. Um, you know, the, the state law right now, as it stands, requires that a percentage of um, teacher performance include, uh, and administrator performance include, some measure of student growth. Um, what that looks like at the local level is something the committee is going to be fleshing out. I don't think it's a matter of saying um, every student you know, who doesn't make growth on the smarter balanced assessment, which is the common core assessment, um, it, it, it shouldn't be that simple. The work that teachers do is, is more involved and more complex, and it should be differentiated. We should be looking at, uh, um, you know, growth in the reflective process, for example, in an art student. I mean, I think there are a number of ways to look at it, and, and again, that's, that's the task of the committee. The committee right now is still We've only met once. We're scheduled to meet this week. Our first task was really to develop a purpose statement so that we can be clear about the kinds of pieces that we think are important to us here in Cape Elizabeth. And ultimately, the board will have the responsibility to adopt an evaluation plan. If that evaluation plan differs um, with what the current state expectations are, then that's something that would be part of our innovative district plan and saying, here's what we believe is best for our school district. Thank you. Are there other? Michael? Yep. Uh, yes, I'd like to thank uh, the superintendent, the administrators, um, all the teachers, and uh, many community members that were involved in the strategic planning committee. 
Um, you know, this is uh, the work um, of many people across the community, and I think it, um, you know it's easy to say here's a goal. The challenge is identifying you know initiatives or action items to to achieve those goals. So I'd like to thank everybody again for those who are involved, and also. Um, congratulate uh, all those involved on establishing benchmarks that many of them are aggressive and um, not being afraid to say you know 95 percent it may be challenging to achieve but we're not going to set benchmarks low just to say we achieve them we're going to stretch and realize that you know maybe not all of them be achieved but the initiatives and actions are in place <coughs> Um, that we're moving in the same direction because when I talk to community members it's like well how do you know Michael how the schools are doing you know how can we measure that and I think this puts it all in, in claim and in, in clear view of you know these are aggressive goals yes some of them are five years but there's going to be professional growth measurement so I um, want to give uh, support our teachers and that some of these are aggressive and it can be scary to have a oh my gosh, I need to show this much improvement. And um, you know, the good news is we'll have community feedback, uh, parent feedback, teacher feedback, and we'll adjust them as uh, they need to be adjusted. But I think it's an aggressive plan that's fantastic. I couldn't be happier that we have uh, measurable benchmarks, but also specific action items to, to achieve those. So this is the work of the school district, and this is um, the hardest work to do and it's hard for the school board to understand you know all the different pieces but I think given the involvement all of all the stakeholders and the commitment to do the right thing for kids is what comes through to me so I'm ecstatic and excited and look forward to supporting uh, teachers parents students uh, the administrators and superintendent and, and making this um, become alive and I would just add the school board as we look at our retreat goals, a big challenge and opportunity, well, how do we communicate this to parents and families that have a million other things to goal? So we'll do a lot of work on the education process so everyone understands um, you know, where we're trying to go and, and how we're gonna get there. But I'd like to thank everybody for the third or fourth time, but realizing that this can be scary as a teacher or administrator, but we're excited and we have confidence that we'll, we'll make progress and um, achieve a lot of these objectives. May I respond? Yes. So thank you, Michael A., for calling out the members of the community who participated in the mission and vision and um, initial strategic planning work. I intended to do that at the beginning, and I'm sorry that I neglected all of you, but um, that's how we got here. And we couldn't have put this work together without that foundation being in place. So um, thank you to those folks. The second is, while these are June 2018 goals, because we felt that it was appropriate to set a final measure, for many of these there will be incremental progress steps. And so while we said 95% of students you know, by 2018, we'll expect to see that we're moving towards that target every single year. So we'll be, and as we report to the board at least twice annually, um, as we've discussed, then we'll be sharing with you, here's the progress we're making towards these goals that we've outlined. Um, the, other, the other piece is, yes, once we have adopted this, communicating it and figuring out um, the best way to do that is another important decision. We're, we've done some back-end work on that um, in the district office, but I, but I think that's a really critical piece and uh, making sure that our full community understands this. It's not work that we can do on our own. It's work that involves the board. It involves community support to, to help fund some of these projects and sustain the good work that's done by, by our teachers and our faculty. And it's work that involves our faculty, administrators, and staff working really collaboratively um, to, to reach these goals. Just so people understand on the board what our process is going forward, the reason we postponed the, the annual school board goal setting retreat was so that we could have this, this plan in front of us before we go into that. Um, and so we'll, we'll set aside considerable time on Friday um, to, to um, dig, dig deeply into uh, these initiatives and, and um, each of the steps toward toward achieving them and, and um, you know, hopefully that, that gives the, the board a, a really good opportunity to understand what this plan means uh, and ultimately to get behind it and support it. 
um, going forward. So that's what we'll be doing, uh, doing with a good part of our time on Friday. Good to know I've got my homework. Yes, yeah, so, so read it carefully before then. And take copious notes. <laughs> and take notes. Um, are there other questions though before we move on? Okay. Well, thank you, Meredith. Um, and now item 5E, the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, let's see. We'll start it. What this else order. have you been doing? Um, well, I'm going to talk about some other things that have been going on around the district. At the high school, we have three students who've been named 2014 Presidential Scholar semifinalists. There are three students of 560 students across the country. So I want to recognize Kevin Hare, Matthew Reale Hatem, and Nick Shedd um, for being recognized uh, Congratulations. on that list. Uh, I'm excited to announce that the main senior games will be back here in September. They'll use, they use um, the high school and, and the pool, um, but they'll be hosting basketball and swimming here again this year. Our Special Olympians recently represented the district at the Winter Games, and those students will be coming to our March meeting to be recognized, so we'll speak more about um, their accomplishments at that time. We have two robotics accomplishments I want to point out. Um, one is that eighth grader Nate Labrie um, made it into the semifinalists at the recent VEX tournament held at Erskine Academy in January, and he has qualified to participate in the state tournament. Um, he was one of very few middle schoolers involved in this tournament, so congratulations to him on his hard work. I also want to ra recognize Jasper Hansel, who won a design award at that same um, VEX tournament, and um, again, that's a, a special recognition from the judges. Greg Marles, our Director of Facilities and Transportation, has renewed his Integrated Pest Management Certification. Uh, while that may not seem like much to you, it's a really significant piece of work for our district. If, if, if you don't have someone on staff who has that training and certification, it's a, it's a service you essentially are forced to contract out for. Did you say pet? I'm pet. sorry. No, I said pest. Okay. Not pets. Not the things you actually want to eat, <laughs> but the things you really don't no want. Way. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. Our high school gym floor, as we speak of facilities and transportation, I mentioned at the last meeting that we had some water damage. We have heard from the insurance company that they will cover the cost of those damages. Right now we are looking at August as um, a timeline for the reinstallation of the floor so that it will be ready more or less for the start of school. Maybe, depending on drying time and the humidity levels in August, it might be a little later. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Andrea Fuller, administrative assistant in our office, for coordinating the workplace giving campaign for United Way across the district. And um, staff members across the district contribute funds to the United Way on an annual basis. And um, we receive a letter of thanks from the United Way talking about some of the ways our contribution helps the community. But that couldn't be done without someone sort of coordinating those efforts. This is, a, this is an alumni note, but I've, I've heard um, and seen, and some of you may have seen as well, some news reports about Delaney Ratner, who's a 2011 graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School, and she and her dog Kelso recently won first prize at the Westminster Agility um, Competition Ooh. over the you weekend. You pet in there somewhere. There you go. That was the pet you were thinking of. That was the pet. <laughs> um, the middle school recently held its spelling bee, and Mike, if you can... In, if you can shout over the names, I did not write the student's name down and I thought I had it on a piece of paper. Can you tell me the winner of your middle school spelling bee who is representing us? There. Um, yes, we had Lila Goudreau, I think is how you pronounce it, um, was our winner and Derek Allen was our runner-up. They went to the Cumberland County Spelling Bee and Derek Allen finished as runner-up at the County Spelling Bee. So if the winner is unable to attend, Derek would go representing Cape to the uh, next level. So, Thank you. Exciting. <laughs> the middle school also held its variety show um, back last month. Cape Celebrates Literacy will be back this year. This year, instead of just a week of events, we're going to be spreading those events over uh, out across a month. So it'll run from March 12th to April 12th. The theme this year is telling our stories. And the idea really behind that is, is twofold. One, we have a storyteller who will be joining us um, for two weeks this year, a week at Pond Cove and a week at the middle school. Um, his name is Len Cabral. And he, some of you may remember him from last year. 
but he'll be working with our students on telling their stories, but we also want to encourage members of the community to come forward and tell their stories. Um, there will be a number of aspects. We're working again with the Thomas Memorial Library. Um, we'll be having an author fest on April 12th, Saturday, April 12th. So mark your calendar for that day. It was a great event last year, but we hope to continue our partnership with other community organizations um, and businesses as well. If you are a senior living in the community and you are interested in telling your story or working with a student to tell your story, please contact uh, me or our office and we'll help connect you with students because we feel that um, it's a really important piece of, of um, helping people understand Cape Elizabeth and the experiences of the people who live here. Uh, elementary school has held its two third and fourth grade music concerts. Some of you I know were in attendance, but I want to thank um, music teacher Becky Bean for the great work there. And again, there you saw highlighted some of the work our students are doing in both French and Spanish um, as a part of, of the language. Um, Pond Cove Craft Night is tomorrow at 5.30. And there's a snow date of Thursday, but I don't think we'll need it. March 4th and 5th, the high school will be hosting its one act plays. March 6th is Career Day at um, Cape Elizabeth Middle School. And again, I want to thank the many um, members of the community who are volunteering their time to come in and work with our students that day. It's a great opportunity for our students to explore some potential career options, whether it's culinary or forensic. There are a lot of, a lot of possible things to consider. Um, NECAP scores were released, we'll be reporting on those at the March business meeting. The public release actually of those items doesn't occur until um, the end of this week, or tomorrow technically is the public release, so we'll share that information with you at the next meeting. Um, as I mentioned before, Pond Cove and the Middle School have both held some technology evenings for parents. Um, I've, I was at the Pond Cove night last week, as, was, um, as were Kelly and Julie and, and their team, um, but it's, it's helpful, I think, for parents to have an opportunity to really talk about some of the challenges that they face, as well as to understand the work that's going on in the schools around integrating technology into the curriculum and, and how we're helping our students um, build their digital citizenship skills. Pond Cove will be celebrating 100th day on February 12th. That is, well, maybe 13th. That's right. Unless there's another snow day. Um, <laughs> So that, those are learning experiences centered around the number 100. If you've had a student at the elementary school, you know well what that is. If you haven't, please come, <laughs> come talk with us. We can tell you all about it. The annual um, Pond Cove Craft Night, as I mentioned, is, is um, tomorrow night. And during the last week of each month, the grade levels at Pond Cove are taking turns donating items to the Preble Street Resource Center. So our fourth grade students contributed um, several boxes of things at the end of January, and grade three is taking its turn at the end of February, grade two in March, and K and one in April. So those are some highlights of things going on around the district. Thank you. It's David. I, I just want to note something. There was a long list of accomplishments there, but there was one accomplishment that was extremely rare, and it's an unbelievable accomplishment this young lady's dog winning the Westminster Kennel Club thing, that is an unbelievable accomplishment. This is one of those, I don't know, I can barely get my dogs to fetch, but this is an unbelievable accomplishment. And she apparently was assisted in training by a, another Cape grad. And it, it's, a, it's, it, it's hard for us, at least it's hard for me, but this is a, a tremendous accomplishment for a kid to do. I mean, this is heavily competitive, a lot of money spent, um, it's just a tremendous thing for a kid in this town to accomplish. Yeah, she's, she's currently um, a college student. She, um, I know, was competing on the circuit last year, I think on a full-time basis, and was involved in some agility trials work when she was still in high school. But again, I think it's an example of students really pursuing their passions and, and having the freedom and opportunity to do that, but also building that academic foundation so that they are um, prepared to pursue whatever um, opportunities make themselves available as they move forward. Okay, so, so Meredith, I, I'm, I'm not sure, did the insurance or did the um, adjuster determine whether or not the, bas the gym had to be partial or full replacement? It's a full replacement cost that they're covering for us. Okay, so we're just going to do the full thing. We will do the full thing. Are there any? Okay. Um, I got to go to two of the three nights of the middle school laptop, uh, iPad uh, conversation. 
And I'm sorry that I can't go tomorrow night. The information was provided. Three, the three librarians were there. I'm sorry. I'll Library information Let's. technology specialists. Yes. Uh, all, thank you. All three were there. They gave an excellent, uh, took us from where the parents were at that time to down to down the road and what the kids will be doing. We're hoping the kids will be doing by um, in high school. It was very, it was very helpful, and um, I, I changed a lot of my thinking about the iPads as a, a set of the way I let my children use the iPads. Now I changed a lot of things because of uh, their work, and it was an hour, scheduled an hour. They went way past an hour. They gave their time, um, time and patience. It was a really nice presentation. Yeah. And I want to thank our um, high school and middle school parent associations for their work in helping to sponsor the technology nights at the middle and high school levels. And again, our staff, our library information technology specialists, our technology integrator at Pond Cove, all have been really involved in, in putting together that information in a thoughtful way and trying to be really responsive to questions and concerns um, that parents have. Um, that just reminded me, because it connected me back to the library learning commons, but I know we have some seventh graders seventh graders or eighth graders who are sharing um, plans that they developed as part of a geometry unit for the use of the library learning commons. Oh, fifth graders. All right. It's getting late. <laughs> um, but who are sharing plans that they developed in a geometry unit for reallocating the space, repurposing the space within the middle school library learning commons. So they're doing actual presentations to an audience tomorrow or Thursday. Thursday. There you go. I have none of the facts correct, except I know the big idea. How's that? <laughs> it's very hard to hear yourself think. This yeah. um, but anyway, I, I mean, I think that's a great example of students really applying some of the skills that we talk about here to real life situations. They are actually using, oh, here are the things that we're learning in geometry about angles and area. And now we're going to actually think about what that might look like if we were designing the use of a space within our school. Um, and then to present that to an audience, because one of those designs is likely going to be a design that it then takes shape, or a combination of those designs that takes shape over the summer to transform that space for the upcoming school year. That's cool. And th that was their message, to have parents look at the way kids are using the tools to say, what is your child interested? It's not just gaming, because they're in front of a screen, they're actually using physics and geometry and all that to bring a passion out and how can you connect with your child to learn about their passion and really develop it, which is just great with the strategic plan. It's amazing. And thank you for that. All right. Thank you, Mary. Uh, on to new business. Item 6A. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the World Affairs Council trip to Dartmouth College Model United Nations Conference on March 28th through the 30th, 2014. Second. Second. Elizabeth. Um, is there any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Item 6B. I have a motion. I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth Pass Part 1 and 2 budget costs for 2014-2015 in the amount of $40,997.31. Is there a second, Elizabeth? Um, is there any discussion? I can just speak to you briefly so that people understand the Part 1 costs, which are $40,600. $25.76 worth of that $40,997 are determined based on a formula. It's based on the average enrollment over two years in the Portland Area Technology High School, as well as the cost that it takes to run those programs. So we pay a percentage of those costs based on the number of students who attend over a two-year period. So that's a, that number is established through a, a regional agreement that, um, that we are part of. The Part 2 costs are established based on requests for additional equipment or replacement of equipment at the Portland Area Technology High School. So the total amount is about $25,000 worth of new equipment that they're purchasing sort of beyond the budget outlay. 
and our portion of that cost is the $371.55. It includes things like, um, uh, I can't give a good example, but um, heating equipment in um, the, the heating and plumbing um, courses that they run. It includes um, a new floor mat for the dance studio program. A new KitchenAid mixer. A mixer yeah. for the culinary program. So enrollment over uh, this year over last year was up significantly. Do, do, you, do we have any expectation of where enrollment in PATH is going? Uh, I mean, Cape Elizabeth student enrollment at PATH. I don't know that it, it's been fairly flat. It was up significantly. The two-year average it's last year was number, higher. It's a small number, but it was, it went from five to nine, I think. Correct. So it's, I mean, I, I'd say we range from a half a dozen to a dozen generally on an annual basis. Um, it's early students are just beginning to, they're just beginning, as someone pointed out, the course selection process, in fact. Um, they haven't really fully begun that yet as we talk about the program of studies later on, but, but we'll know that better um, by the end of the year. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah, just on the, is this a, it's a Portland area shared cost model? It, um, so so I, at what point do we make an assessment if this is, is it mandated that we have to do it this way or we can say, well, maybe given if it's five students on average, we can internalize the cost and maybe provide a better um, option. In other words, we, we've always done this way, but who says that's the best way to do it? So the, there are nine sending school districts who attend the Portland Area Technical High School, and each um, sending district has a school board and superintendent representative or their designees um, who vote each year on the budget. There are me monthly meetings where you review bylaws, equipment requests, types of programs, the value of the programs. I would say, you know, even though we only have five students attending, we could not um, reproduce the types of experiences, the variety of experiences that those students are having for $40,000. Um, we supply transportation to those students as well, so that's a cost that you don't see here, but even though it's part of our budget. But for example, those students may be enrolled in five entirely separate programs. A student might be involved in the horticulture program, another student in the culinary arts program, another student in the music production program, and we don't have the facilities or the capacity really to offer those students those same types of in-depth, hands-on um, experiences here. So basically we can provide uh, better educational opportunities for our students at a lower cost than we could on our own. So that's, that's I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Are there any other discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. All right, um, item 6C on policies for second reading, Joe. Sure. Um, I move that we approve the policies for second reading as listed out in item, is it 6C? Um, ADR, JICA, and JLCD um, with the no changes recommended for those that are listed under that heading and also with the recommendation for deletion or removal from the policy as listed under that heading in item 6C. Second. Elizabeth seconded. Um, is there any discussion? David. I have a quick question on the deletion of the athletic rules and regulations. Um, I read that and I also read what we're going to be considering for first reading, JJJ, which is the policy for co-curricular and high school eligibility. What's the reasoning for eliminating JJR? Is it because it's... It, it, it's because it's procedural and uh, as we have talked about as a um, policy committee, the recommendation of the policy consultant is that those things which are procedural don't necessarily have to be part of your board manual. You can choose to keep them that way or you can move them to be administrative procedures which are overseen by district administrators. So in this case, it would be overseen by the high school um, athletic administrator and high school principal. So... Um, and middle school. I guess I have to ask the question, is it being moved there? You say it can be moved there, is it being moved there? Yes, that's yes. the intent. And it will be identical to what it is in this? That's correct. Okay. Uh, it, it gives us the flexibility though if there are changes. If the MPAA, for, 
um, MPA, Maine Principals Association. Sorry, I went to another state for a second. But um, if the Maine Principals Association um, determines that there are some changes to the eligibility requirements, and they vote that as an organization, we then, as an administrative team, can make those changes, inform the students, parents, and coaches of those changes, inform the board of those changes, but we don't have to wait two months to go through the policy committee procedure and adoption for changes that we don't have control over, essentially. Okay. So the, 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 the goal is to give administrators more flexibility where, when it comes to, to areas of administrative procedure that don't need to rise to the level of the, the board. I, I see the, the, the logic in that. It's just that you've got to make sure that your regulation comports with the policy we have is JJJ and that's somewhat difficult when you move it out of one place and put it in two different places but I, I, I think it's a good move. I'd just like to reiterate for the public that the reason that most of these things on a monthly basis that you might see for deletion are because they are procedural and they are being moved into those other manuals or they're redundant or they are law so they're, they're not policy if they're mandated by law we their law. We have to do that. So, a way to streamline the policy manual. Thank you. Any further discussion? I just had a question on the honor roll. Um, I know we've heard from students, um, you know, the thought of the honor roll. If you look at it, it says uh, you're, 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 you achieve honors if you have an 85 or better. And then, you know, if you have an 83 or 84, it's a C plus. So, uh, I've always been confused a little bit the, the the purpose of the honor roll um, we have highest honors and then honor and um, you know maybe as we look at our strategic plan and some of those goals it looks like there may be some asymmetry between that um, I just want to be mindful we've heard from students saying you know um, so many people get honor so what does that mean if you don't um, and I didn't I don't have a solution, but I'm just mindful this is one we may want to revisit. Um, and everyone can tell a story. When I used to go to school, this was the number, and um, that I went to school in Georgia, so don't worry. It's, uh, um, so I would just I'm just mindful that that it's a sensitive issue, and that I, I think it's something we should be mindful that we may need to revisit and get more student input on on the honor roll and why is 85 you're on the honor roll but 84 you're not kind of that's an issue that I've been discussing for seven years now about the seven point versus the ten point system and there is an, the answer is essentially you got to draw a line somewhere our standards are actually higher when I grew up it was a ten point system in a lot of states it's a ten point system to make the honor roll you can get an 80 an average of an 80 ours is higher the fact that more kids make it is a function of the fact we have a high-performing district with a lot of people whose parents are duly college educated and so forth. I am not surprised we have a lot of kids make it. I'd be surprised if we didn't. And so we already, just so you know, we already have a, I'm saying this for the public, we already have a, a uh, higher system in order to make honors, high honors and highest honors than is true in many states and many other areas. The other um, question I think we also need to ask and consider, and I believe we've heard some feedback from student representatives around the publishing of the honor roll in the paper to sort of help alleviate some of that um, sensitive pressure. And so I don't know where we've ended up on that issue. I mean, I, I, Sierra could tell us as well as anyone, but the high school student, student government essentially said, we don't want it published in the newspaper. No, that is a very common thing to hear. Nobody, the honor roll is kind of a dreaded thing to think about. And I mean, I guess my question would be, why do we have A's and B's necessarily? Why don't we just have numbers? Why, because really before junior year, those numbers don't really mean anything because Getting those numbers used, used to only mean getting in the paper, but now it means we can have freeze, so we can go anywhere on campus that we or in the building that we want um, if we have an 85 or higher in every class. So I really don't understand the purpose of them until you graduate or in, until you're a junior. 
I guess that could be a question to be asked. I have actually one more question as well, and I'm not sure if it's so as much to do with the student's response to the honor roll, but also as we move forward and change to a efficiency-based efficiency -based system, standards-based, is this even going to be relevant in a year or two? Um, I, I think its relevance will be lessened. Um, I, I think as we are working through a transition process, it may be difficult to eliminate letter grades entirely mm -hmm. um, over a short period of time. I think that will, would be a more gradual um, transition, but, but I, I would agree. And I think that was your point, Michael, in saying this may be something we need to revisit. Um, but I would say if, you know, if it's the will of the board to remove this policy from the agenda for tonight, that would be a perfectly acceptable option. We could well, I, I'm going to state the opposite view. I, I think it's nutty not to have letter grades or number grades. There is a point. You have to, you're competing with the rest of the country to get into college. And we can put down good, nice, great job, whatever we want, and we're hurting our kids getting into college. Whether we like it or not, this is the grading system that's used. And the fact that it gets into the paper, a, a lot of people will argue that that creates an incentive for people to make honor roll or high honor roll or highness honor roll. They get some recognition for it as opposed to some quarterback scoring some touchdown and getting it in the paper. There's two significant sides to this. So the, the, what's before us now is the, the, the policy on the honor roll. So if, if, if there's, there's a proposal to or, or an option to amend, amend the motion, but um, we don't have to make a decision about better grades um, tonight. So I, I wasn't, I was just saying, if you, you know, as we look ahead at the strategic plan and we move to a standards based or proficiency based, you know, there may be, you know, that this policy may need to be reviewed as that changes, you know, are you the most proficient, you know, in other words, it, it may change at a certain point. So I'm fine with the policy. I was just reflecting on comments on the public that were, you know, times may change, strategic plan may take us in a dir different direction, um, but just responding to some comments I heard from citizens. Right. Thank you, Michael. So, um, no changes to the motion. The, mo the motion stands. Uh, all those in favor? Okay. Item 6D, Joe. Um, I move that we have the following policies that um, move forward for first read. JAIC, Student Code of Conduct, JICH, Substance Abuse, and JJJ, Co-Curricular Athletic Programs and High School Eligibility Requirements. There's no vote on this tonight. It's just a consideration for a first read. We are putting these policies forward. Do you need to... There's no motion, so I can... Sorry, right. Right right ahead. That. Yeah. Um, we're simply putting these policies forward for a first read out into the public to hopefully gather your feedback and comments as we move forward in revising these policies. They are probably the three most sensitive and often used policies that get pulled out of our policy manual. Um, they affect a great deal of um, students code of conduct and expectations, and I'm going to um, withhold some comments for a few moments because I sense that I know for a fact that there are some other members on the board that may at this time like to also add some comments regarding these policies. I was just going to say it may be useful for um, board members to know that the policy committee has been looking at substance abuse in particular over a long period of time. That's work that we began in the fall, I would say. Um, and it's been something we held forums, we um, put out a survey, we've reviewed that information, and the policy committee has spent a great deal of time deliberating this, so it's brought this forward as a first read, um, feeling that it's really important to have a full board discussion about how we feel um, about this policy in particular and, and really the scope of this policy. And, um, people may have seen articles about what's, what's occurred in Westbrook um, related to their substance abuse policy and the scope of that policy. Um, it, it's, a, it's a policy that is sensitive, that is controversial, that um, every community has to wrestle with. And it's an opportunity, tonight's really an opportunity, I think, for the board as a whole to 
talk about their beliefs and, um, and how they feel this policy should move forward. Will Jeff be reviewing the substance abuse policy in particular? That, that's one request we made at our policy committee was for um, our high school principal to share a little bit about Time. Not yet. <laughs> uh, for our high school principal, don't worry, to I'm share sorry. how the substance abuse policy, basically to give a rundown of the substance abuse policy and how it works at the high school level. Would you like a copy? So, in a nutshell, um, first of all, there is one rule that applies to all students, everybody. doesn't matter whether they're in athletic programs or student government or SA, um, math team, any of the teams. This applies to all students, and that is students um, are on school grounds or at a school event um, on or off school grounds, um, then, and they either use or in possession or under the influence of substances, and they are caught <coughs> in that way, then there are two things that happen to those students. Well, there's really one thing that happens to those, to those students. Actually, there's two things that happen to those students. <laughs> one, they are all referred to the substance abuse counselor. Is really the major purpose of these policies that just try, the most important thing is to channel assistance to students, to figure out who needs some significant assistance from students who are just making individual bad decisions but not part of a pattern that would suggest any serious issue. So that's one thing that happens to all students for on school grounds or off school grounds but at school events. The most common thing where that applies is for example being a spectator at the Portland Ice Arena or at an away event or something like that. The second thing hap that happens to students who are involved in violations connected to, directly connected to school is that they are suspended from school. Either for four days, which is it's expressed in the policy as the norm, but it's actually the exception uh, because it's the, the rule is they're suspended for, two day, for four days unless they agree to see the substance abuse counselor to get some additional assistance, to have some, some channeled attention and that sort of stuff, in which case they are, that suspension is reduced to two days. Every student I've ever dealt with has always opted for the reduced suspension. Um, so that's pretty much what happens is a two-day suspension for events on school grounds. The controversy, and I think that policy is relatively uncontroversial. I don't think it's ever really been directly challenged by policy or seriously questioned. The part of the policy that gets questioned, um, and there are strong philosophical arguments on both sides, and that is for students who are involved in certain extracurricular activities who represent Cape Elizabeth High School in athletics or in competitive uh, major extracurricular programs like science team or the jazz band or theater or there's a whole host of activities and they are listed. There is a notion that's embedded in our, our substance abuse policy that the school board has had in place for a number of years that students who use <coughs> are in possession of or under the influence of illegal substances even though that may happen, that violation may happen off school grounds, that those students temporar are risked losing temporarily their opportunity to participate in that covered activity for a limited period of time. Um, the first offense that a student has off school grounds um, the student may, within 48 hours, report themselves or their parents may report themselves that there has been a violation. And then, 
the only consequence for that first offense self-referral is referral to the substance abuse counselor. There is no loss of games, there is no loss of activities. If the student doesn't report within 48 hours and it's later found out that the student has made a bad choice off school grounds and is still representing Cape Elizabeth in those com competitive activities, then the student will lose um, the opportunity to participate in those activities. There's a bit of a complicated formula because different activities have different um, frequencies of competitions or performances or things like that. Um, but the, the sort of baseline picture is if a student is involved in, a, for example, athletics, involved in, let's say, a, 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 comp, a sport that has more than 10 countable contests in a season, that student loses two of those contests. And comparable amounts for other sports depend, or other non-athletic activities depending on the number of competitions. So that's what happens first offense, non-self-referral, in addition to a referral to the substance abuse counselor. That always happens. That's the constant for all of these offenses on or off school grounds, whether it's connected to activities or just events that happen directly connected to school. Um, the recent Portland newspaper <coughs> article, I think it was yesterday, might, maybe, um, highlighted one issue which has been very controversial in a number of communities, and so I thought I would mention it because it's not in our policy. And I want it to be clear, this is not in our policy, nor is it recommended, nor would I recommend that it ever come into our policy. Some schools have a rule for off-school grounds activities that says, if you are at an, a party or an event where others are violating the rules, the laws against substance abuse, that your mere presence at the party also is a violation of the substance abuse policy. We do not have that in our policy. Um, a couple of other things about our policy. First, there's an escalating series of consequences beyond the first referral. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of it. It's spelled out pretty well in the policy. Um, the second thing is um, and last year we did a really good job of sort of explaining this policy to students. I think most of our students, perhaps with the, with the exception of the freshmen, have a pretty clear understanding of this, that the off-school grounds part of the policy applies from the first day of preseason if a student is involved in fall athletics. From the very first day of preseason all the way through to the last day of the school year. It's not a policy the way it's written currently that only applies during a season that a student is in competition in. In other words, if you're a part of the basketball team, you do nothing in the fall, there's an incident that takes place in September, October before the basketball season, that is still a violation of the policy. That student can face a consequence in basketball if that's the next athletic um, uh, team that a student is involved in. Um, the policy does not apply during the summertime. Um, but there is no between-season sort of exemption either. The only exempt period at all which isn't covered by the policy is the summertime. Um, cigarette use is also covered. Um, the once, one difference between cigarette use and other substances, controlled substances or alcohol, is that there is a provision in the policy for students who provide, furnish illegal substances to others, actually subjects the student to, for on-school grounds activities to, instead of a two-day suspension, which is the norm, that student is, faces a 10-day suspension. There's an exception in the policy for that, for students who provide cigarettes to others. And I think those are the major highlights of the school board's substance abuse policy. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions, clarifying questions, if that's okay. I just want to clarify, you left out one thing, that if you're caught on David. school grounds or a school-related event, in addition to a suspension, 
if you, if you believe to have been a, by a violation, it's also a referral to the police department. Automatic. Yes, there is an automatic. Yep. So that's a fairly significant additional item. But that's limited to on school on grounds school or school gr related on activities. Yep. For on okay. school grounds activities, there is a mandatory referral to the police. Yep. Sorry. I may have forgotten some other things as well, but um, I think I've hit the major ones. Other questions for me? Thanks, okay. Jeff. Yep, Appreciate sure. it. Is there any other discussion? Um, I would like to just add a few comments in support of the policy as it is written. Um, and in order to sort of um, give some background to my support of the policy as it is written, I'd like to share some data and some statistics, if it's okay with the chair. So according to the 2011 statewide Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, students who do not believe that they are going to be caught to drink are twice as likely to drink alcohol in the past month as those who do not think they would be caught. Of those who are caught, 90% of them tend not to reoffend. The BHAS data, the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey data, also demonstrates across the board lower academic performance for students who report using drugs and alcohol in the past 30 days, and that's according to on the survey. Um, and some other more national statistics around underage drinking in general, um, two third, the importance of why we want to address underage drinking and alcohol use and drug use in our students is that is a public health issue. Two-thirds of underage drinking deaths are not attributed to cars, but they are attributed instead to drownings, falls, accidents, homicides, and suicides. Only one-third of underage drinking deaths are actually attributed to car crashes. Underage drinking is also closely aligned with unwanted and unprotected sexual activity and other risky behaviors. In addition to why we as a district need to address underage drinking and substance use is the effects that those have on our adolescents. The adolescent brain is a magnificent machine. It's ready to dive, jump, run, chase over and under through any opportunity or challenge placed before it. We see this in almost every month as school board members as we sit here and honor those who win endless championships in our districts. But this comes at a high or a slight cost, and that is the undeveloped prefrontal cortex. I don't know how you read all of that stuff over that. This is impressive. Um, the undeveloped prefrontal cortex, which luckily for our champions is often the part of the brain which says, don't do that, you can't do that, it's too risky. But it's also part of the adolescent brain that's, that is not working after school hours, off school grounds, and on um, attended events. It is this lack of ability to realistically judge risk is something all of us in the community have a vested interest in trying to steer our kids to make the right decision. Adolescence is also a time of fast and ready learning, higher math, languages, science, and addiction. Because of this, students who begin drinking before the age of 17 are five times as likely to develop an alcohol use disorder as an adult. In addition, Alcohol is insidious in our society. Messages glamorizing its use, messages underscoring its necessity to imbibe in order to have a good time, or even worse, messages kids see that alcohol is necessary to unwind, relax, or to better be able to socialize, often go unchecked. There are very few opportunities that we as a community have in order to counter these messages and collectively approach this problem with a community-wide solution. Our schools are microcosms of our community. Their borders are porous. What goes on outside of school, off school grounds, affects the culture, behavior, and readiness to learn within. As has been highlighted in the news recently, school policies are not bulletproof and are, are certainly only as strong as the support that they get from their own communities. 
I fully support retaining the section of the policy with which covers additional consequences for students participating in co-curricular and extracurricular activities for all of the reasons stated above. Please note the enforcement of this section does not involve any school suspensions or expulsions, as our principal has pointed out, but it does include referral to meet with a substance abuse counselor, which is often one of the most meaningful things that we can provide in any of our school policies is to early intervention and, if necessary, referral to treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Elizabeth? Um, I also would like to speak in support of the, uh, the policy as, well, as written, rewritten, moved around, and, and re put back together. Um, to me, uh, one of the, the big changes that was made that kind of got rearranged was the, the separation of the policy as it applies to the entire student body on <coughs> school grounds or at school activities. Um, I think that the goal here is, number one, we don't want students coming to school under the influence. We don't want substances sold at our schools. We don't want, I mean, and I think that everybody, we can all agree on that and we can, so I think, I think that understanding that there is, there is a, you know, there is one blanket policy, it, it covers everybody and, um, there are consequences for those behaviors. There are, there are not just consequences for those students who take advantage of the privilege of extracurricular activities. So while I understand the necessity of moving that back into the policy, my hope is that it is very clear, at, Jeff was very clear in his explanation, so my hope is that it is very clear. Because number two, I, I do believe that you are, exercising a privilege when you join the drama club, when you are on the basketball team and that sort of thing. It is not a right. It is a privilege and with privilege comes responsibility. And you are representing your town, not just your school but your entire town. And you are also responsible to your team or your group. And so how you behave during, during the school year reflects on your group reflects on, you know, and it also affects your performance with that group. So um, I don't feel that it, we have unreasonable consequences. I feel our students have a right to their consequences and to their understanding that, you know, with this, with this privilege, you, you know, there are different consequences. You've made this choice and, you know, um, I just can't stress enough, they have a right to those consequences. So um, I was really happy to learn when I started reading this policy that we don't have um, the, the section in there that is probably the most controversial about the knowingly present, which I don't really support, but I, I think it can inhibit students from making good choices, actually. Um, so again, I, I support it. Locally. Thank you. Any other comment? David. Um, I have a variety of comments, I, I, um, but I would, if I could, I will talk about both substance abuse and the student uh, code of conduct, which are interrelated. Um, I don't think anybody disagrees that drugs are bad, that alcohol is bad, that it affects uh, uh, adolescent brains, that it affects their ability to do work. That's not a dispute What, to me. Um, what is a dispute is um, a variety of things in our current policy, um, I think. And it's, uh, one is, uh, I, I do, um, there was a discussion at the policy committee level, and maybe that has been dropped, but extending a substance abuse policy to all students in all circumstances, regardless of whether or not they're on a school team or involved in extracurricular activity. I have, if that was discussed, I want to state on the record, that would be a nightmare. It's, I doubt that it's legal. I doubt that it's enforceable. And I think it would be a nightmare. Secondly, 
uh, understand that when people participate uh, on the, ex the extra penalties for uh, people who participate in sports, it's also extracurricular, co-curricular, it's getting awards. You may have earned an award for uh, some scholastic achievement. It can be taken from you. Um, I don't buy the arguments that that is a good thing. I think the best thing to do for somebody, um, and this is off school grounds, because on school grounds they get treated like everybody else. And again, I don't think, I mean, I could come up with circumstances where certain events on school grounds do not warrant a suspension or an expulsion. And I think that's a, a, a discussion about whether or not we have a, a series of, of possible penalties instead of an automatic suspension or an expulsion. But nobody should rationally dispute the fact that when you do something on school grounds, there's other kids' welfare as well as your own that's involved. And that's, that's something that we have to tightly control. I think it's odd, I think it's somewhat discriminatory to punish students who, who are involved in sports or extracurricular activities more than students who are not. Because in essence, by participating, first of all, it's, it's, I think it's somewhat discriminatory. They have extra penalties as kids that don't participate in that half. Secondly, I don't buy the argument that because, quote, they're representing the school, that somehow they should get penalized more. All kids represent our schools. They all wear school shirts, school jackets, and when they get caught, they're, they're identified as being from Cape Elizabeth. It all reflects on our schools. The question is, to me, is if these extracurricular activities, and quite frankly, I think there's a question about whether or not extracurricular activities and co-curricular activities are a, quote, privilege anymore, or whether they're a right. And I think there's, I don't particularly want to, in public, make legal arguments for somebody, but I don't think it's necessarily a privilege anymore. It may very well rise to the level of a, of a right. Uh, and I think that makes uh, a big difference. We are able to extend it to off-school property and off-school events because they sign a contract allowing themselves to be punished that way. That's how we get to that point. Um, and I, again, this justified on the ground that's a quota privilege, you're allowed to restrict privileges more than you are rights. The most important reason why I have a little bit of a problem with it is that we want kids to in, be involved in extracurricular activities and uh, get academic awards, be in theater, because that's good. It seems odd to me that we include as a punishment taking away things that are good for student behavior, good for socialization, good for kids uh, to try to achieve, good to teach them loyalty, honor, all kinds of things. Why we pay all this money for extracurricular activities? Why are we then denying those people that ability? There are other ways to punish kids besides denying them something that I think actually does good. I mean, that's my opinion. Um, uh, do we want to just limit the comments to the, the substance abuse and not the school code? The, um, the student code of conduct is part of it. The okay. Um, policies that are brought forward for first read. So, if you have a comment, I think now's the time. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just want to put one more nail in the coffin of of trying to regulate kids' conduct uh, outside of school and outside of school-related activities, because arguably that was a discussion, and arguably our student code of conduct does apply outside of school grounds and school-related activities, because it says in there school grounds, school activities. And if there's a material effect on this very amorphous standard, it could materially affect the welfare of a school. Well, I can drive a truck through that. So arguably, on the student code of conduct, it applies to all students everywhere. And it has all kinds of punishments. Granted, it's very flexible. It can be anywhere from a reprimand to um, suspension to all different kinds of things, which is good. I like. I, 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 you know, we do have an opportunity to, re to write the policy to do exactly what, what we, you know, to more carefully to, to, so that it accomplishes what we're trying to accomplish. So I think if, but if you could hold the discussion to what, to what we're trying to accomplish with the policy, that's where we're, that's where we're focused as opposed to. Well, I, I am. I'm trying to say that I'm not sure the student code of conduct as drafted should be as broadly drafted as it is to apply to things with such an amorphous standard 
we are going to regulate your con and by the way the student code of conduct regulates a whole wide range of activities that might one might consider fairly normal although not great student activities such as you know um, um, anywhere from from um, not, not even involving substance abuse. It's anything, it's any violation of any law. Like they drive and get a, a ticket, arguably applies to that. So I'm raising that as something to look at when we look at the student code of conduct. Okay. It applies everywhere and so broadly to any possible violation of law, as well as things that may not be violations of law. Like um, maybe it's just because I'm, I was not such a good boy when I was in junior high and high school, but it applies to any kind of conduct that might be considered one might think was roughhousing, one might be thinking is wrestling, one might be thinking is minor altercations. It's raising that to a level of some fairly significant punishment. And it's anywhere, as long as it, it fits within that general standard. Um, my view is that outside of the, where we have responsibility, it's up to the parents. It's up, and maybe we put into the policy that when these violations occur, parents are notified or there's some graduated conduct, but um, I'm not sure that it's that, that we're achieving what we want. Secondly, I have a problem in our current substance abuse, as well as our code of conduct, where there's automatic report of some of these. And remember, these aren't convicted people. These are people where you suspect or have reason to believe have violated the substance abuse or the student code of conduct. It's mandatory reporting in the um, substance abuse and it's optional reporting in the Student Code of Conduct. Uh, except where it rises to the level of a serious, then the superintendent must report it. I don't know why on earth we're criminalizing some of these activities in a school setting. There's a lot of literature nationally um, about that is, you know, criminalizing young kids for what might otherwise be considered adolescent behavior. Um, I, I think that's a serious problem. And, in particular, we, we did notice in the uh, substance abuse one, there was a, a section which previously required that if there is a hosting of a party, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, there must be two things done. You must report it to the parent, some of the parents aren't there, and you must report it to the police. The proposed change doesn't exactly do a very good job. The proposed change is you must report to your parent or to the police, which means if you weren't able to get to your parent, I mean, you have to turn around and report to the police. And if Falmouth ever indicated anything, that's a nightmare. And I don't think parents would be all that pleased if, you know, there's some party over which they had no control is held on their premises that it must be reported to the police. I think that's a provision that also needs to have some work. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It is hard to talk over that. And I'm pretty good at usually talking over most things. Um, If you bear with me, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to condense all my thoughts. Um, um, uh, to make one further point among this automatic or optional reporting to the police, it was historically required under the, under the Reagan era as a result of federal funding. Um, my understanding is that that, that, that funding that was, and we should check this out, it's no longer required by law that you, that you report it to the police. It, it was required in order to get federal funding. The federal funding doesn't exist anymore. So there's no requirement for us to report it to the police. And we should think long and hard before we, we report some 14-year-old to the police and have them go through that process for anywhere from substance abuse, which is a very serious thing, but a lot of the literature, uh, the more modern literature says that punishment is not the way to go. Punishment doesn't work on 14 to 18 year olds, or threats, or, or um, what really works is a positive change. Let's see if I can articulate it properly. It's where, I'll give you two examples, smoking and um, drug abuse. It's very hard to get, we had all this uh, uh, smoking laws and we had all this um, uh, the discussion about cancer causing, but what really caused kids to declined smoking was when they framed the argument as in terms of you realize why you're smoking is because large companies put nicotine in cigarettes and you're really helping large companies you should take control of your body and that actually had a significant material effect on whether kids smoked or not. Um, the same thing with with uh, drug abuse and alcohol abuse. It was it isn't the punishment. 
It's Dr. Siegel is the one who's the pioneer in this field. It isn't the punishment, the criminalization, the suspension that works on drug abuse and alcohol. The more, none of this is universal, by the way. It's, but the, the, the literature suggests now that the, the, more, the better thing to do is the substance abuse counseling, where it's pointed out to the person, look what you're doing to your body. Why don't you take control of your body? Why are you putting in alcohol and these sort of things? Look at the long-term effects. Then the kid, and it's, it's positive that I'm taking control of my body, I can avoid these things in my body, it's actually been shown to have a material effect. Now that's kind of a nuance, but it, the main point is, I don't think we should automatically be thinking about criminalization or, or suspension or expulsion in, in a lot of these instances. We should be looking at other alternatives. Um, I also have a couple of other problems with um, there is a whole investigation section in the substance abuse and the uh, code of, student code of conduct which requires school administrators to investigate. And in some fairly minimal, if they have information or if a parent tells them something, they're required to then investigate. And uh, well, these are administrators, they're not, they're not detectives, they're not investigators but they're supposed to investigate and follow up on violations of student code and violations of substance abuse. They bring kids in, they're not trained investigators, kids aren't warned about the Miranda rights, there's no requirements in our policies, procedures about any recognition these students have constitutional rights. Um, I, I just think it's something we should be taking a, a long, hard look at. All that being said, I'm not supporting the use of drugs or alcohol. I'm just saying that we shouldn't necessarily um, using schools and school administrators to do the work of police and police department and detectives, especially when there are more effective ways of doing it. Um, let me just see if there's any other major points. Um, I guess the last one would be, and something I argued at a policy meeting, I think my personal view and supported by some of the research is that a more flexible approach to what we do to kids that get caught either violating the student code or caught violating substance abuse or alcohol. I mean, technically right now, a kid could drink a beer, go to a school dance, alcohol be smelled in his presence, and you know, he's suspended. Um, and that does have consequences beyond four days. As I talked about, that's something that has to be reported on the common application to all colleges. And I believe that does have an effect it's hard to prove, but it could have an effect on somebody's ability to get into college. Over drinking a beer when you're 14, going to a dance, geez, I would never be in college and I'd never be in law school if that was true. So I'm just simply saying is these, these policies should be thought through in terms of what are we trying to achieve, which is cause kids not to do this behavior, what are the con and then benefit then weigh the what we're doing is whether or not it, it, it creates an adequate response to what's being done and tries to put the kid on the right road without such life-ending concept or life-impairing consequences that we might have in our current policy. Okay, thank you, David. Um, is there any other discussion, Kate? Thanks for your um, thoughts, David. You always speak well and always make me think. Um, on the policy, I come down to how school and parents can work together with the community to keep our kids safe. Knowing that kids are learning um, as they go, frontal lobe is developing, the adjustment is developing, and they're risk taking, and they're, and they're managing that themselves, and with bigger and bigger consequences all the time. It's a fear of mine, if we take anything out of the policy, kids don't have that first wow, um, look at this is going to happen to me if I do this. What I think we're doing as a, um, a community and as a school and particularly is um, we're educating, doing a really nice, every year I think we get better at the message we give the kids so that when they get to school they're not just signing a piece of paper, we're making the work more meaningful. We've had more time with guidance counselors and the substance abuse she has a school social worker, substance abuse counselor. Right. In the last two years, we've um, made that higher, and we've increased those hours. 
Um, when we look at our uh, the people our hiring staff, we hire with background. When we hire administrators, we hire with background. I know that it's in it's on our minds to to do our work as adults for the kids. I want to make sure this policy doesn't take any responsibility off of the parents for raising their children. I want to just make sure the parents know that we're in partnership with them to do what we need to do to educate, help them educate their kids and talk about uh, the real issue, which is drugs and alcohol um, and, and prescription drugs that are available. Um, we have hope that's a strong program that's getting stronger. I think that's where I wouldn't want to do, take anything out of the policy because I'm not ready to um, let an inch go for a child to say, wow, these are big consequences. And I do believe if a kid goes down the road and makes a choice and gets in trouble, uh, gets caught taking the choice, that therefore they then... Um, through the work that they do in school with the counselor and with their peers and with the administration, they write about it in their um, comp in the comp in the application and they reflect on it and they do some mindful. And you know what? Maybe if they need to take a year off and do some other work, in the long run, going right to college isn't might not be the best choice. So I, I'm not saying, I don't think that's totally a negative. I don't think it's a negative for having a child sit on the sidelines at a, a um, sporting event or at a mock trial. They still go to practice. Jeff, I could be wrong. I believe they still go to practice. They're still part of the team. They just don't play. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a built-in wow um, that we want to give our kids because otherwise, um, I have a lot of, I have to, some kids in the household would say, oh, they read really well. This doesn't apply to me. This doesn't apply to me. This doesn't apply to me. And I want them, I want it all to apply to them and to take it personally. So I think our policy does, keeps them, gives them the wow factor that I'm looking for. And until there's something else that will give them the wow factor, I'm not ready to change it. Thanks, Kate. I just uh, want to say that I, I, uh, I support the policy at this moment, at, at this time, the way it's written, um, for a couple of reasons. One, it, it seems to be working. It seems to be e effective. Uh, I think we're fortunate that uh, the policy has a, that we have a leverage with our community. And I think policies are reviewed routinely for the possibility of uh, changes in population or changes in philosophy. And currently, it seems that uh, the community and the, the families that live here um, uh, definitely support and reflect the, the reasons why they would want to follow and, and stay within policy and not have the consequences. Um, which I feel is, is a, a luxury to, to a degree that we live in a community like ours where um, the vast majority of families and students care to stay in, within this, you know, the rules of this regulation. Um, I also want to encourage public and, and, and parents to continue to review and um, provide feedback on, on their own feelings um, about school slash parenting um, and, and if there's a line that they they want more blurred or if they want a line more clear. Um, so I think to, su to support part of the goal of, of bringing the community together with the school, the school district, uh, we really need the parents' voice um, equally and as loudly as the administrators and school board. Thank you. Is there any further comment, Michael? I, I'll make it uh, very brief. Um, uh, I appreciate that everyone sounds like they've read the policy in depth for a first reading. Um, I've read it, but I would acknowledge that there's some uh, challenging parts uh, to, to understand. 
Um, I've said this before, you know, if uh, these are consequences. So if we ever have to, you know, what are the consequences? It's too late. So my hope is as a district, we spend an equal uh, amount of resources on, on preventing and educating um, students so that they, they don't get to this situation. Um, I'm fine with most of the policy. I do agree with David that I um, am trying to better understand are we mandated um, to report certain behaviors, criminal behavior to the authorities? Is that a state mandate or is that a cost benefit analysis that if we didn't report it that we would be assuming a liability because I am concerned, um, you know, a student on an application or, you know, I'll, I had, you know, had a beer in my backpack. Um, you know, do they automatically get reported? And, you know, obviously the police, but I, I'm not sure on what the rationale for an automatic reporting mechanism to the, to the police would be given. It does have consequences. Um, so that part of the policy, I would say, is the one I need to study up more or get some more feedback on um, what the rationale is. Is it a liability to the district because we're obligated to look at the safety of all students or if it's if it's not how do we make an assessment of, of the cost benefit um, just trying to better understand that that reasoning um, but um, I know it's challenging and it's um, there's the message if we make a change what message does that send but at the same time it is complicated and I think we're need to be open to if there's parts of it that we can't justify through reason or rationale such as the criminal automatic reporting we need to you know be able to justify that if we if we move the policy forward in the current state it is okay thanks so the, the next step for this policy will be um, it goes back to the policy committee which meets on Monday March 3rd at 7 30 a.m. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of material for continued discussion there. So thank, thanks it, to everyone for their attention to this important policy. Uh, and on to item E. Uh, athletic extra and co-curricular staff nominations. May I have a motion? I move. I move. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Elizabeth. I move we approve the following athletic, extra, and co-curricular staff nominations at the high school Mary Page for national championship competition of mock trial, at the middle school Joe Doan for indoor track, and Paul Wellman for indoor track. Is there a second? second. Uh, is there any discussion? David. I, I just would add, and whether it's considered an amendment or not, but we're, we're not only nominating for these positions, we're also paying them a sum of money according to the attachments included in our packet. So we're proving both their positions and the award of some stipends to them as well. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Item 6F, the approval of Super, the superintendent's recommendation for administrators under continuing contract. Uh, may I have a motion? Sure. I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendations for administrators continuing contract renewals for 2014-2015. And those administrators are um, high school principal Jeff Shedd, high school assistant principal Troy Henninger, <clears throat> um, the athletic director at the high school level, Jeff Thorak, and Jane Golding. In, uh, I, uh, instructional support. My apologies, Jane. Second. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? I'll, I'll just clarify that continuing contract as part of our collective bargaining agreement is administrators who've been employed with the district for more than two years, and we have a, a within our collective bargaining agreement we're required to notify those administrators by March 1st. So we typically bring those nominations forward in February. David. I'm just curious, what on earth has Jeff Shedd ever done to justify continuing his contract? I'm sorry, I couldn't help say that whole thing without laughing, but. 
I couldn't resist, sorry. <laughs> I, I think Jeff said. You want to follow that up, David? I will follow that up with a blanket statement that <laughs> flatly, I think we have the best high school principal in this state, bar none. Thank you, David. Uh, is there any other? Is there any other discussion? Kate? I'd just like to say thank you for <clears throat> considering coming back another year, everyone who uh, we've named, because it is a really tough job, and we appreciate um, all the dedication that Troy, Jane, Jeff, and Jeff, Jeff do for the uh, district. Um, Anything else? All those in favor? Item 6G, the Cape Elizabeth High School Program of Studies for 2014-2015. May I have a motion? David. I move that we approve uh, the CE, uh, Cape Elizabeth High School Program of Studies for 2014 to 2015 as attached in our materials with the notation draft to February 6th, uh, 2014. Is there a second? Okay, thank you. Um, is there any discussion, David? Um, yeah, I, I have a couple questions. I, uh, it's it's kind of hard for us to try, and I, I know why we're doing this because we're legally required to do it. I'm glad to see you were being asked to do this. First, maybe my memory's going with as I age, but I don't remember being asked to approve the program before. But we are required. I, I guess I'm just curious on two things. One. Uh, we obviously have to make sure that we're funding all these programs. We're proving this now when it comes time for budget process. And I guess the other thing is for Jeff, um, I, I just sort of briefly want to hear your thoughts. Is there, is this a, any new changes to this program? Any deletions? Is there, I, I know you would like to have other things added, but can you give us some comments on it? Um, in terms of substance and courses that are offered, um, the only additions or changes are on page 15, I believe. <coughs> so this, the addition specifically is for years we have had senior English as we have junior English and sophomore English. And, but we haven't had sort of um, areas of emphasis and choice senior year for students who are interested in exploring in depth um, some particular areas of English more than others. Um, so this year, the, um, thinking about the program of studies this year, the English department actually talked to juniors, I think. Maybe seniors. I can't remember which it was. Was it juniors? It was juniors. OK. Um, and sort of elicited some ideas about areas of emphasis that might attract students to have an opportunity to explore in a little bit greater depth than sort of generic senior English provided. At the same time, to see those courses as a bit of a stepping stone in terms of moving on to college and that sort of thing. So in talking to students, um, the two flavors that emerged as the top, but I will say before I mention what they are, is these are areas of emphasis, but the main learning results, the common core, all those things, students will continue to learn to argue, to read literature, and those sorts of things. It's that these courses will have a bit of an emphasis on these particular areas, and one is in creative writing, um, and the second alternative is in topics in film and media. Again, both the courses will contain significant elements of reading, literature, reading plays, reading other things, looking at um, different oil interpretations of them in terms of media and things like that. Um, and the other thing to note about the senior English is there remains um, AP senior English as an option as well. Um, so students will, and that curriculum, AP senior English is really um, has pretty tight standards uh, by the college board. Um, so there's not quite as much flexibility um, to be able to do these sort of areas of emphasis. So basically, 
next year's seniors will choose either AP Senior English or they will choose um, an Honors or CEP um, English class which has a focus area in one of those two alternative areas. Um, those are the only um, new courses that are listed. Um, if you see courses that are listed in the program of studies that you haven't been aware we offer, um, one of the things that we do have every year is we, there are courses that we offer in the program of studies and because of student sign up there aren't enough to run and sometimes that's true for a couple of years in a row. Um, so there may be some unfamiliar titles to you but they are not unfamiliar to the program of studies. They've been part of what we've offered for uh, a number of years. While you're up there, um, information night for eighth grade parents and families is the 26th of yeah, February? Eighth, yes, um, eighth grade students <coughs> and parents um, are invited and we'll be getting a letter shortly of invitation to our annual eighth grade elective open house. We haven't really started the formal class selection process um, yet, but we will with uh, assuming the board approves this program of studies tonight, then we will begin that process very quickly. Um, and for eighth graders in particular, it's their, really their first opportunity to sort of have some, a little bit more choice in, in courses in some of the elective areas, including uh, foreign language, the arts, um, and social studies. There are some electives, um, and so we're, we use that night on the 26th um, at beginning at... Um, five o'clock in the high school auditorium to educate, to introduce parents to what the elective opportunities are in the high school. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's happening as well. Thank you. Sarah. You also added, um, you split the AP <coughs> physics into two different types of physics. So the APC, I was talking to Dr. Efron, he said that was new as well. I think that was actually in last year's program of studies as well. Uh, the, what, what Thierry is referring to, and it's true, it, and it sounds new because we haven't actually, off, it hasn't actually run yet, um, but if you look, what page is that, Sierra? It's 21. 21. So if you look on page 21, this is what Sierra is referring to. Um, let me find it. The College Board has um, two flavors of AP Physics C, both of which are calculus-based physics classes. Um, the first one is actually on the lower right of page 20, which is AP Physics C Mechanics. Um, that's the course uh, that's, that's actually running this year. There are a couple of sections of that. And at the upper left-hand corner of the next page um, is the other flavor, AP Physics C Electricity and Magnetism. So that is, uh, those are two alternatives uh, that students will have to select from for those who are interested in AP Physics. Any other questions or? I know it's late. I just, um, yep. you know, parents say, you know, wow, we have great robotics. There's a lot of interest. And then someone says, uh, you know, uh, robotics or engineering <coughs> STEM is going to be, you know, the jobs of the future. So. Um, I know we have the strategic plan and going forward, but at um, expectation, you know, is there going to be a robotics class or, you know, future programmers? Where's the programming? You know, just feedback yep. from parents and I Absolutely. say, well, give us, you know, there's reasons and a schedule, so maybe that would help. So I, uh, we actually did for a couple of years have a robotics elective opportunity in the high school um, for seniors and it did run and it did get a, a number of students but quite honestly as he as Evan Thayer who is um, sort of headed up the robotics program K through 12 thought about sort of the opportunity cost of binding his time up in the high school teaching robotics program versus building a ground up robotics program um, beginning in the younger grades, he is selected and I think he's, I think he's the right, I think it's the right selection to try to put his efforts in that direction. Um, as those students come farther up the, the program and they're getting close at this point, um, I'm sure that we will get back to offering robotics elective again. Um, the other piece is in terms of programming, um, we are actually piloting the second semester uh, under uh, Evan's leadership with Ginger Raspiller, um, who's the Achievement Center coordinator, is going to be helping him as well. We are um, going to, a, a small group of students uh, are going to have the opportunity to um, take a, an off school, out of school hours um, independent study in programming. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's um, 
It's a gentleman who just recently graduated from Stanford University a few years ago, and, and he and a partner of his have a web-based um, uh, programming class, essentially, and he actually came and demonstrated that class to a number of our teachers and students last year. So Evan is actually going to be piloting that beginning in the next couple of weeks, if it hasn't already begun, and it may have. So, And programming is an area that we, we do need to get more in, in, involved in. There's no question about that. I would say there are a couple of students who've done independent studies in robotics when there hasn't, in years when there hasn't been a class run, and you know there are situations sometimes where if we're not able to meet those student needs internally, we, we work with them to sort of get a good match. It might be a course at SMCC or at USM that is going to help meet that interest. Um, the programming discussion is one that's going on really K-12. Um, Evan Thayer, as Jeff mentioned, is really working K-12 now. Um, Ruth Ellen had the opportunity to observe a couple of weeks ago, and Kelly, um, and they're, I'll see a lesson in um, early March, but Evan working with first grade students around really using um, the techniques and strategies that students are learning in robotics to apply those at a first grade level in the classroom setting. Um, we're having conversations really about what should technology education look like K-12. Ruth Ellen will be doing that work um, with our teachers moving forward as well. But we anticipate that you know, programming will be part of the middle school curriculum, part of the elementary school curriculum as we move forward. So students who are arriving at the high school level who maybe only had the extracurricular opportunities thus far are going to multiply um, because it will be part of the everyday curriculum for all students as we move forward. Great, thank you, Jeff. The, the other thing I will mention, just as an advertisement, if I can, um, ev well, Roger Rio, um, Ginger, and a number of math and science teachers are also organizing a major event. Um, I think it's on May 21st, um, where there are going to be scientists, engineers, technology folks in all realms of technology coming, and it's essentially a STEM career day. Um, and that is, you'll, everybody's going to be getting more information about that. They've been very excited by the number of folks who have volunteered to come in and speak to our students. and demonstrate some things, so we will be generating that interest um, and complementing the work of Evan and the robotics people and other folks as well to, to really spur that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Is there any further discussion on the motion in front of us? All those in favor? Seven there. All right, the next item, seven. Committee reports, are there any committee chairs who have reports to make to the board? Um, I, I just went to my first, first paths meeting in January and you know, I'm not sure how much of this is already um, common knowledge um, in prior school board meetings, but um, one, one comment I wanted to make was in reference to the, the part two um, budget that the amount that they're requesting this year is significantly lower from other years. So I think this year is about 25,000 and other years it averages 75 to 1,000, 100,000. Um, so that's you know, just one comment I wanted to make. But um, they are working uh, closely with um, meeting the Common Core uh, guidelines and, and, and requirements. Um, but one of them in particular, it just makes me think of it um, talking about Evan Thayer, um, they are expanding their construction technology um, curriculum so that, so uh, curriculum and also the guidelines that are required by looking at um, SMCC and uh, other p p uh, senior and junior courses so that they're coming up with a list of uh, suggestions and guidelines that will be made available to counselors and uh, administrators now, uh, you know, if they want to educate um, their, their young freshmen or sophomores now in case they're headed in that direction um, by the time they graduate. Um, and also they're in the process of um, trying to recruit or build their school roster for next year. So if, as a school board, we're interested in um, having them make a presentation either to the school or the school board or administrators um, about what their um, program offers, that now is the time to make that request. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Are, th are there any other committee reports? David. Um, the legislative liaison committee, um, Ameris is attempting to set up, I think has set up, a meeting with uh, Senator Millett and uh, Kim on hand. And, I, and Representative Hammond as well. Um, to discuss some issues, uh, some of which we know about. There's potential changes in the EPS formula, which will never change, will never inure to our benefit. Uh, there's some discussion about changing uh, retirement sharing, which won't inure to our benefit. And there's some other issues that I think uh, Meredith is trying to, and, and Rebecca will obviously come with her own, that we're going to try to get on top of before uh, we get into the budget season. I, can you maybe? Uh, general purpose aid is another example. Yeah. There's some discussion at the state level of reducing funding to general purpose aid under the belief that school districts didn't spend all of the money that was allocated after most had voted on their budgets last year. Um, You've got to wrap your head around this one. That money that was given to us after we approved our budget that we never got to really have anyway, so they now want to cut it. Uh, and or maybe right. cut other money, so it's pretty yeah. bizarre. Uh, they're also talking about uh, a universal pre-K program for four-year-olds. Uh, there are a number of issues. Municipal revenue sharing is another one, which while it doesn't dir directly impact school funding, it impacts okay. taxpayers within Cape Elizabeth. So those are several of the larger issues um, that, that we hope to discuss on Friday when we meet. That's this Friday. That's this Friday, Friday the 14th two, one, one? I believe one. But it okay. One or one, two, I can't remember which. All right. Hmm. Well, we'll have that agenda item Two. coming up. So by Two o'clock. Okay. We may still be here by that time. <laughs> All right. We're going we're gonna to try to move through that. I know everybody's – I was driven to distraction by the radiator. I'm sure everyone else was. Um, I'll try to move quickly. Uh, the, the school board um, – just one other thing. We, we dedicated our workshop last month to meeting with the Community Services Advisory Board. The community, uh, the, the community Services Department falls under the, the, the school department. Um, but the school board is, spends its time, if, you, if you're a regular viewer of this program, uh, mostly <laughs> concerned with the schools. Um, the community services department does have its own uh, citizen advisory board. Um, that board is, is chaired by Fred Sturdivant, um, who's uh, dedicated an extraordinary amount of time to serving on that board. I think, I believe, uh, six years of service to the community services. Um, so thanks, thanks to Mr. Sturdivan for that. Um, and he gave us a presentation uh, on their work um, at that meeting. Um, he said the Community Services Advisory Board has been working closely with the, with the Director of Community Services on their budget proposal for uh, next year. Uh, and they are confident um, that they, the Community Services will put forward a budget that they can strongly support. Um, they uh, are, are, uh, have made a commitment, um, not, not for next year, but um, for uh, upcoming years to, uh, to try to uh, figure out how to acquire a mini bus for community services, uh, particularly uh, for the purposes of uh, transportation for seniors um, to and from community services programs and maybe within those programs and, and also um, for transportation for their adult programs. Um, so that's an initiative that's important to community services. Um, uh, they also reported um, that they have revised the staffing model uh, and, and the marketing efforts around the fitness center. Uh, and um, they have seen uh, some, some considerable success there in terms of the, the usage and the, and the, um, and the, the, the re amount of revenue that they're deriving out of that. Um, that fitness center, which was uh, an issue that came before the board um, last year. Um, so the, the school board is looking forward to increasing its, its communication with the Community Services Advisory Board, um, and we plan to meet again with them in the fall. Um, but again, the, the, the way that the, the reporting structure works there, just for any, any citizens who have issues at Community Services, Obviously, the first thing you ought to do with the issue is discuss it with the community services representative closest to the issue. But if that uh, doesn't work out, you would take that issue to the director of community services um, and from there to the community services advisory board. And then after that, superintendent of schools and finally the school board. Uh, is it just a 
brief overview of how that um, structure works. So that was that meeting, and I don't think there are any other committee reports. That's Two better. things. One, we still need some members for the Community Services Advisory Thank you for reminding so me of that. If you are watching this program faithfully and have your Tuesday <laughs> evenings available, they can Wednesday. Use, oh, I'm sorry, Wednesday. It is Tuesday. That's why you're watching the program. But if you have your Wednesday evenings available, um, we could use, use a couple of members for that commission. And again, you can contact the superintendent's office. The other thing I would note is that um, the school board finance chair presented um, on behalf of the school board, a proposal to the town council at their work <coughs> at the end of January regarding the bond request for 2015-2016. And um, the town council will examine um, that request as part of um, their 2014-15 budget deliberations. Thank you for those. Uh, so on to item eight, um, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for items to go on upcoming school board meeting agendas? Seeing none. Um, item nine, announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, this week's uh, uh, negotiation meeting with the um, Cape Elizabeth Education Association scheduled for Wednesday has been postponed. Um, and the school board has its annual goal setting retreat on Friday uh, morning at 8.15. Uh, thank you to the folks at uh, St. Albans Church for providing us with space for that meeting. Um, and uh, we mentioned the legislative meeting on Friday at 1 in the Jordan it's Room. At 2. Sorry, I at 2. 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock in the Jordan Room. And the upcoming policy committee on meeting on March 3rd at 7.30 in the Jordan Room. Are there any other meetings? Upcoming Two evaluations meeting. on Thursday at 315. Mm -hmm. The teacher evaluation committee is meeting on Thursday at 3, 315. 15. And you mentioned the <coughs> workshop, which will be the overview of the budget on February 25th. On February 25th. Yes. One more, John. Yes. Thomas Memorial Library Building Committee will be every two weeks. Um, so today's the 11th. So the 11th is the what, 25th. Second? The 25th. Yeah, so second the and second and fourth Thursday um, till the vote, until the referendum. It's open meetings. We also meet with the, um, the architect is planning on being there each time. So public is welcome. Um, great time for input. Thank you, Kate. Uh, on to item 10. May I have a motion? I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Seven. Thank you. Oh, thank you.